infectious diseases and identify infected individuals has never been so timely as it is today in the COVID era. But the problem has been around for as long as we've been studying disease transmission. Resources for disease testing are never infinite. And in cases where the resources are stretched thin, whether due to overwhelming prevalence or limited technical capacity, optimizing the information gained from a testing regime is, is crucial. Testing samples in groups rather than individually can be an important step in this process. Today we have two award-winning speakers and experts in the area of group testing, Chris Builder from the University of Nebraska and Chris McMahon from Clemson University. Each will, take a, each will give a roughly 45-minute talk, and if there's time between the first and second talks, we may be able to take a question, in two, or a question or two. We're not really too worried about nailing the timing perfectly on the session, but we also don't want to get too far behind out of respect for other people's schedules. We do have plenty of time set aside at the end of the session for questions for either speaker. If you do have questions, please use the designated box at the panel below. Um, if you use the chat, I will try to pick it up, but there's a chance that chat questions can get scrolled off the screen and I might miss them. Um, so let's get into it. Our first speaker today is Chris Builder. Chris is a professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Chris grew up in Nebraska and got his bachelor's at the University of Nebraska-Omaha before traveling south to Kansas State for his master's and PhD. Chris has been working in group testing problems for over 15 years. Most of his work has been in collaboration with Josh Tebbs from the University of South Carolina and with our second speaker, Chris McMahon. The research has been funded by R01 NIH grants and has resulted in numerous publications. Their team has won ASA's Outstanding Statistical Application Award twice and the Best Paper in Biometrics Award. Chris was made a fellow of, of, in the ASA in 2016. Chris will open our introductory overview session with a talk focusing on group testing for identifying cases. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. And thank you for all, the, all those who are attending here. Now, advance to the next slide. So, um, you know, most people believe that testing for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that leads to COVID-19, is a very important component uh, to getting the world back to normal. So, for example, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeted out on March 26th that restarting our economy will require one thing above all else, testing. Governor Andrew Cuomo tweeted out on April 7th, it's all about testing, testing, testing. Now, unfortunately, there has been and in some respects still continues to be a shortage of testing resources. For this reason, um, myself and many other individuals, including statisticians, clinical pathologists, economists, have been advocating that laboratories should just group it when testing for uh, testing specimens. And what we are referring to is the use of this procedure known as group testing. Here's briefly how we've used group testing in Nebraska for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Um, what we've done is taken portions of five specimens from different individuals and amalgamated them into what we call a group. And we test this group as if it were a single specimen. And the reason why we do that is because if a group tests negative, then all five people within the group can be declared negative just with one test. If you were to have tested every specimen separately or done individual testing, which took five tests to determine that five people were disease-free. Of course, though, a group could test positive. And in that case, we go back to the individual specimens, uh, the remaining portions of those specimens, and we individually retest them to determine who's positive and who's negative. Now, the reason why this is of interest right now is because group testing can significantly reduce the number of tests when applied in appropriate situations. In other words, when the disease prevalence is small and when the group size is chosen in an appropriate manner. 
By decreasing the number of tests, what that also means is that we can increase the overall testing capacity because all the testing resources that we would have used to test every single specimen uh, separately, those saved resources from reducing the number of tests can now go into testing more people and labs really want to increase their testing capacities. Now you might have heard about group testing discussed in the media since May, there's been many accounts of it out there. Um, I think the most late, uh, most recent account was in the New York Times back on um, July 27th, or last week. There have also been many publications that have been written on group testing uh, applied to testing for SARS-CoV-2. These have been peer-reviewed publications, but especially uh, there have been hundreds of papers on preprint servers posted. With respect to uh, uh, peer review publications, the first four publications out there that focus on uh, testing this out on actual specimens are listed here. And we're going to take some time talking about the second paper uh, because I'm a, a co-author on that. Interestingly, uh, group testing has already been suggested in the past for previous pandemics. There is a great paper by Van et al. that kind of foreshadows our experience that we're having right now. And what they investigated was, well, how group testing could have been used for the H1N1 uh, influenza virus pandemic that we had about 10 years ago. The idea of group testing is not new. Um, I've seen references all the way back to 1915 uh, for the origins of group testing. But most people point to a paper by Robert Dorfman that appeared in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics way back in 1943 as the origin. Uh, Dorfman uh, was working in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. government, and he and, him, and his colleagues uh, were interested in looking at how they could test for syphilis among U.S. Army initiates in an efficient manner. And they came up with this idea of group testing. Then uh, Dorfman put the idea, uh, ideas corresponding to it together and got it published in this journal. Now, the way that Dorfman suggested to do group testing is essentially what we're using in Nebraska. Test in groups. If a group is positive, then go to a second stage of testing and test each spe specimen individually. Um, now, most people in medical fields and in many other uh, fields of application as well uh, often think of it this as the only way to implement group testing and that's uh, actually kind of a, kind of too bad uh, because as you can imagine since this idea came about 70 plus years ago there have been a lot of advances in group testing since then that uh, allow one to test much more efficiently what I mean by efficiently, I'm referring to um, uh, the number of tests that would be needed are reduced even more than using Dorfman's original testing idea. Uh, but also, this then means it will increase the testing capacity uh, significantly more. Um, and so there are many other group testing algorithms out there now, and I will present some of those here today. Group testing has a wide variety of applications right now. Uh, one of the biggest is with respect to blood donation screening. Uh, for example, the American Red Cross uses groups of size 16 with Dorfman's original idea to test for HIV, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and West Nile virus. There are many applications outside of human infectious disease detection. Um, so for example, disease detection in animals, um, uh, detecting bacteria in food, and the development of new pharmaceuticals, where group testing is being used now. Now, with respect to the statistical aspects of group testing, uh, those, of you, those of us who are in this area, we typically break it up into two different uh, parts. Uh, first, there's what's called the identification problem, where what we would like to be able to do is come up with an expression for the expected number of tests for a particular group testing algorithm. This is very important for laboratories to know so that they can plan ahead in their own implementation of group testing. 
Also, it's very important because you can use in this expected number of tests to figure out what would be the optimal group size to use. In other words, the group size that leads to the lowest expected number of tests on a per individual basis. In addition, uh, one can also come up with expressions for the expected accuracy of a particular group testing algorithm. And as I said, there's many other group testing algorithms out there. So you might want to compare them and use that to help determine what might be, be best for a laboratory. Now, in addition to the identification problem in group testing, there's also the estimation problem in group testing. And that's what my colleague Chris McMahon will be discussing in his portion of this session. Real briefly, uh, what one is interested in this uh, situation is to estimate perhaps an overall disease prevalence uh, or to uh, estimate the probability that a specific individual is positive for disease given certain risk factors. So I'm going to focus on the identification part of group testing. And uh, because obviously COVID-19 is so important right now, I decided to gear all my examples uh, towards uh, testing for SARS-CoV-2. And in the remainder of my talk then, what I will do is talk about how is group testing being used right now, and also how group testing can be used more efficiently uh, than it is right now. Okay, so uh, let's begin by talking about Dorfman's original testing idea. Uh, this is relatively the most basic way to apply group testing. And let's begin with some notation associated with it. Uh, let's let T be the number of tests required for a group of size I. And T will either be a 1 or equal to 1 if the group tests negative. It will be equal to I plus 1 if the group tests positive, where this I corresponds to the I retest that will be needed in a second stage of testing. Now, this group that's in this first stage of testing, we're going to let G sub 1 denote the group binary test result with levels of 1 for positive, 0 for negative. And also, we need to define G tilde sub 1 as well, because unfortunately, infectious, infectious disease assays are not necessarily 100% perfect. So this G tilde 1 is going to be the true group binary status. We're going to let pi tilde sub i be the probability the ith individual is truly positive. And then we can also define the test accuracy for this group. SE1 is going to be the sensitivity. SP1 is going to be the specificity. Then with that notation, we can come up with a, uh, an expression relatively easily, easy uh, for the expected number of tests. So the expected value of T is equal to 1 for that initial test that's uh, being performed on the group. And then we have I more tests if G1 is equal to 1, meaning the group tests positive. That corresponding probability can be written in terms of the sensitivity, the specificity, and the true probability of being positive for the ith individual. Now, there's often a number of simplifications that one will see corresponding to this expression. First of all, maybe you don't have a way to get at the individual probability that a person is truly positive. Instead, uh, you might have to work with an overall prevalence instead. And in that particular case, we can see we have a nice little simplification of our expression. Uh, so we replace then the uh, probability that the group uh, is truly negative with 1 minus pi tilde, where that's the overall prevalence, 1 minus pi tilde raised to the i to the power. A second simplification that you see sometimes is you can say the best case scenario, where the sensitivity and the specificity are set equal to 1. One could also, with Dorfman testing, come up with expressions for the overall accuracy. Uh, I've chosen not to actually present that here today, simply uh, to save time. And also another reason is because there are actually functions available in the bin group 2 package of R that will automatically calculate expressions for the expected accuracy 
and the expected number of tests. Uh, this bin group two package also allows you to, to do these calculations for many other group testing algorithms too. If you do want to know more about what the expression is for the expected accuracy or how some of these derivations come about, here are a few different references where I recommend this paper by Kim et al. is a good place to start. Um, this paper talks about Dorfman testing, and, but also a number of other group testing algorithms too. Okay, so let's talk about how group testing has been implemented in Nebraska. Uh, this was detailed in a paper that was in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology back in April. And uh, group testing actually began at the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory, which is located on the campus of the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. It began there in mid-March. And at this laboratory at that particular time, uh, they were using the CDC's assay that you might have heard about uh, in the media in February and in um, March. And without going into all the details uh, behind this particular assay, I'll tell you it's a nucleic acid amplification test. And where, what they're trying to do is look for the genetic material uh, for this particular virus. And basically what they're looking for is uh, they're looking at two different targets with this test. And these targets need to, uh, you could say, cross a particular threshold prior to 40 amplification cycles for a specimen or group specimen to be declared positive. And if a positive is declared, what is reported is the cycle threshold. When that threshold was reached, uh, we'll call that a CT value. Uh, the CT is closely related to the viral load, uh, but it's not exactly. Um, the example, uh, so for example, if, the, uh, if there was a lot of virus in a particular specimen, the CT value will generally be a lot smaller than if there wasn't much virus in the specimen. The actual testing process takes about four hours to complete. If you would like to know more about the actual testing process, uh, there was a nice article in Omaha's newspaper that described it, and they even included a two-minute video of right inside the lab showing how the process is actually being implemented. Okay, so there's essentially three steps that one needs to follow to put group testing into clinical use. The first step is to determine an optimal group size meaning the group size that leads to the smallest expected number of tests on a per individual basis. And so, do, so to do that, what we did was we worked with our expected number of tests equation, and we ended up uh, using an overall prevalence in that expression. And of course, then we need to decide, well, what should this overall prevalence be? Well, prior to trying to implement group testing, uh, individual testing was being used, and and the observed positivity rate for specimens coming into the lab at that time was 5%. So we simply decided to use that for our high tilde or overall prevalence. But we also need to decide what should we use for our sensitivity and specificity. Well, typically in other group testing applications, uh, you have information about large clinical trials for an assay that's used to validate that indeed the assay works. Those large trials then give you a sensitivity, a specificity, and that's what you would use. Unfortunately, due to, to the newness of this assay, we didn't have that information available. So what we decided to do was look at it in two different ways. We use a sensitivity of one and a specificity of one, a best case scenario. And also we looked at a case where sensitivity was 0.95 and a specificity was one. Uh, where that comes from is that when this particular assay was developed, um, a limit of detection was set so that 95% of true positives with a low viral load should be found from the assay. So now we have the components of the equation. What we can do now is minimize the expected number of tests per individual to find this optimal group size, this optimal I. Unfortunately, there's not a closed form expression for it. 
but there is a nice approximation that works in this best case scenario with sensitivity and specificity of one. And that um, optimal group size from this approximation is essentially uh, use the ceiling function with one over the square root of pi tilde. Now, what happens if the sensitivity is not equal to one? Well, this approximation doesn't work. Uh, but also, you might be interested in an in a exact answer. And so, what can we do about that? Well, fortunately, there's an app for that. Uh, this app uh, is called a Shiny App for Pool Testing that's available on my website. Uh, its lead developer was Brianna Hitt, who uh, works at the Air Force Academy. I was an assistant professor at the Air Force Academy. And we were interested in developing this app uh, due to um, uh, discussions that we've had with a number of laboratories who did a, a large-scale STD testing, sexually transmitted disease uh, uh, testing. And we found that they could really use an app like this. So back in February, uh, we put, let's say, version 1.0 online. And then in mid-March, obviously, our country was inundated with COVID-19 problems, and now this app has become very useful for laboratories who want to implement testing for SARS-CoV-2. So to give you a little bit of an idea of how this app works, uh, on the menu part, part on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, if one were to navigate to hierarchical testing, um, Dorfman's original idea of testing is a special case of hierarchical testing, so that's why we use that term, hierarchical. And then if one navigates down to optimal configuration, that corresponds to finding that optimal group size, one then gets to this screen that we see here in the screen capture. Um, so to use this particular app, then, we can simply specify the number of diseases that we're testing for. One, overall disease prevalence, sensitivity of the assay, specificity, how many stages in the group testing algorithm, Remember, with Dorfman testing, there's two stages. And then also, well, where do you want to look for that optimal group size? Let's say 3 to 20. With that, then, we can click on Calculate. And then down below this table, we'll have some results displayed. So the optimal group size in this particular case is equal to 5. And the expected number of tests when you use this group size is 2.13, or to put it on a per individual basis, meaning take 2.13 divided by 5, we get an uh, expected number of tests per individual of 0.43. This then means that there will be a 57% reduction in the expected number of tests relative to using individual tests, We're testing everyone separately. And this also means that there will be a 135% increase in the expected testing capacity relative to individual testing. This number here is why labs are really like group testing and more labs are investigating it. Now, if one were to also use a sensitivity of 0.95 for this particular case, one also gets the same optimal group size. This app has received a lot of use from all around the world. So this map gives a recent uh, three-month uh, picture of who is actually using the app in terms of their locations. Uh, in total, we've had about uh, we've had people from about 76 countries use the app, and also uh, 44 U.S. states. Okay, so step one of the process was to determine what the optimal group size would be. Step two of the process is to determine if there is a dilution problem. And what that means is as follows. So when you're, let's say, forming a group of size 5, each individual specimen itself is now a smaller component of the overall specimen than if it would have been tested alone. And since this specimen is a smaller component, uh, when you're combining it with other specimens, it will have a smaller amount of the corresponding virus uh, when put into a group of size 5. Thus, it has been diluted by the other specimens. And so that's a, a very uh, important concern whenever, one, when, whenever implementing group testing. And so to examine that, to see if that was a concern, 
for this particular problem, what was done was 25 groups, each with four known negatives obtained from individual testing, and one known positive obtained from individual testing, were put together into groups, 25 of these groups. And each of these uh, known positives had a low viral load associated with it, meaning in the end it actually had a high CT value. And fortunately, in all cases, we were still able to declare the group to be positive. But we tended to need a few more amplification cycles, about two to three more on average, when working with these groups in comparison to uh, testing that those uh, the, the positive specimen individually. So what was done then was instead of making uh, looking at just 40 um, cycles as that uh, determination of positive or negative, uh, what was done was we decided to go up to 45 instead. So if a group came back positive through, let's say, 42 cycles, it was still broken up into a second stage of testing to test to determine who's positive and who is negative in that group. And so that's the approach that then that we did to deal with this uh, potential um, uh, dilution problem. Now, step three of the process then is to actually implement it with clinical specimens. Try it out. And so after the first six days of testing, uh, 0.42 tests were needed on average per individual to determine who's positive and who's negative. Compare that to what we had previously as the expected number of tests per individual, 0.43. So we have close agreement. And since this time, thousands of more tests have been uh, performed, and we've had similar results. Okay. But still, we might be interested in, in, in answering the question of, well, can we do better than what we're doing right now? Can we be more efficient in our testing? And the answer is, yes, we can. And so there are other group testing algorithms out there, as I mentioned previously. And typically, these algorithms are uh, categorized into hierarchical and non-hierarchical categories. Uh, with respect to hierarchical group testing, uh, what we do is we test individuals over multiple stages in non-overlapping groups. For example, Lowe's et al. in a paper that was in the Lancet Infectious Diseases um, used three, a three-stage hierarchical testing process for SARS-CoV-2 detection. And what they did was as follows. They started off with an initial group size of 30 in, let's say, their stage one of testing. If that group is negative, they're done. Everyone's declared negative in that group. If it's positive, then a second stage of testing is used where three groups of size 10 are formed. These groups contain uh, are, are non-overlapping, meaning that each individual is represented once in a particular group. Then, if one of these groups comes back positive, uh, a third stage of testing is used with those particular individuals, and each individual is uh, tested separately. Now, group testing algorithms can have more than three stages. Um, at most, I've seen in actual application, four stages, and the reason being is because each of these stages takes time. If you remember with SARS-CoV-2, the CDC's assay, um, it took four hours for a test. And so if you're going more than four stages, um, that could take more than two work days to actually uh, determine who's positive and who's negative within, a, um, within a, an initial group. Now, Dorfman's testing algorithm is a two-stage algorithm, so it's a special case of this hierarchical process. So let's take a look at some uh, notation uh, corresponding to hierarchical group testing. We're going to let capital S be the number of stages that we're implementing a process for. We'll let G sub S J be the group test result for group J at stage S. M sub S J is going to be the number of subgroups that group J at stage S is divided into if it tests positive. So going back to that Lowe's et al. example, 
m sub one one would be equal to three because three new groups are being formed uh, when uh, the initial group tests positive. C sub s is going to be the number of groups in stage s. And then with that, we can come up with a nice expression for the expected number of tests. It's equal to one for the initial group tests. And then we sum over all the stages, but the last one, because there's no more testing done after that last one. We sum over all the groups within a state. Macula asks, in non-hierarchical, non-adaptive group testing, I think the optimal pool size is approximately 1 over infection rate when optimizing the probability that an individual is in the negative pool. What is holding labs back from deploying non-hierarchical, non-adaptive group testing? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, yeah, clarification here. So non-hierarchical is often referred to also as non-adaptive. Uh, so both names are uh, essentially the same. Um, so uh, my next part of my uh, presentation was actually talking about non-hierarchical group testing. And uh, there can be some advantages uh, to that. Um, non-hierarchical group testing often is uh, more difficult to implement. Uh, so perhaps that's one thing that holds some people uh, back. Um, overall, I've only seen, at least in uh, research publications with actual assessments, only one uh, uh, one laboratory actually using non-hierarchical testing. Uh, they're using what's called array testing, which actually is what I will be uh, focusing on. Uh, array testing is a special case of non-hierarchical. Uh, so I think that kind of kind of addresses that. Um, uh, as you will see, uh, there are some advantages to a, a non-hierarchical approach. Uh, if you can implement it. And with non-hierarchical group testing, uh, what you do is you start with putting uh, people into multiple groups at the initial stage of testing. Uh, so a person might be represented in two, maybe three, or even four groups. And what that does then is that there will be a lot less uh, number of retests that need to be done in a second stage of group testing because these overlapping groups kind of help you figure out who must be a positive. Um, and hopefully if we'll get to it, I have a nice little um, example demonstrating that. So sort of like a lattice you mean? Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay, so if, if row, <coughs> pardon me, if row one and column three are positive, then you suspect that I, individual one comma three is the one that's positive. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, in, in the end, it, it may not end up being that easy because let's say if you have two rows and two columns test positive, uh, then um, you won't have enough information to determine who's positive from the, I guess, the four inter intersections. At least two will be. Right. I, I do have a message from, uh, from uh, one of the JSM uh, meetings people, and she does say that tech support has been called. They've received the message, and they're on the way. Uh, I have no idea how long a drive it is, though. Um, so, so we'll uh, go down to the next question while we have a, a few minutes. I suspect what happened was that, that uh, since your original slides froze, we can't share something else, and they're, ho they're hogging, and, and we just need to clear the buffer. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Chelsea Allen asks, um, this, this may be answered before the end of the talk, is there an advantage to testing groups whose positive negative status are likely to be the same, such as household? And if you did this, would it alter the optimal group size? So I guess that's a question more generally about what happens when you have known correlations among your individuals. And I think that gets at to a, another uh, group testing algorithm, that uh, set of algorithms I was going to talk about, which are known as informative group testing algorithms, where you use additional information available to you, such as, let's say, if some people have symptoms, maybe due to their behavior or maybe due to the household that they're in, you can use that information to your advantage to try to implement group testing in a much more efficient manner. And so over the last 10 years, there's been a number of uh, papers on how to implement that, uh, both in the statistical literature and also the medical 
uh, literature. So indeed, yes, uh, that can be quite advantageous to use information such as household when implementing uh, group testing. Okay. Um, uh, here is a question from somebody who is identifying uh, themselves as a community college statistics teacher. When I heard about group testing, I was really excited to see that the binomial distribution was used in real life, and I shared this fun real-life example with my students. Given your presentation, I think I might be wrong. The binomial distribution isn't the model for group testing. Is that right? Uh, the binomial distribution is the model for group testing. In fact, that's where the where the name for the package uh, bin group two actually comes from, where the bin is the binomial part. And so, um, yeah, uh, the binomial distribution is essentially playing the underlying role here for finding such stuff like as the expected number of tests. And I know uh, when Chris McMahon um, uh, discusses uh, his estimation part, I think you'll see the binomial distribution um, um, brought up even, even more in that particular setting. So for someone like Chelsea, where would be the best introduction? What would you recommend as the resource for, the, for a good introduction for her perhaps to even share with students? Sure. Uh, so um, uh, about uh, one or two years ago, I put together introductory papers on group testing uh, for both the identification and the estimation problem. Uh, those papers are available through the Wiley Stats Ref. Um, like an, it's like an encyclopedia of introductions to many different, uh, many different statistical topics. So that would be one place to go. Um, a direct link to that corresponding paper can be found on my website at chrisbiller.com slash group testing. There you go. That's that, There's your ultimate resource is Chris's website. Uh, Chris, <laughs> apparently tech support says we ought to be able to share screens again, so why don't you give it a try and let's see if we can pick up. Uh, I hate to do this, but can we maybe pick it up from slide 2021 20, because that's where we lost you. Okay, just a second. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's see here. So I have already, I, I changed computers in the hopes that that would do that. Now I have to get my, this particular computer all set up. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so slide 21. Slide 21. So, well, thanks everybody for, uh, um, uh, oh, and Kathleen says that speakers will have the ability to upload slides in the JSM online program in August. So, so we'll be able to catch up with these slides again a little later. Um, yep. So obviously our session is going to be thrown off for timing. Apologize for that, but we're going to go ahead and finish Chris's talk before we move on to, to Chris McMahon. All right, Chris. I, I will um, maybe uh, not go over some of the details to help um, – us uh, speed along here. So on slide number 21 here, basically what I did was I presented an expression for the expected number of tests. Uh, the main thing you need to get out of it is that indeed one can actually come up with a closed form expression for the expected number of tests. And then using that information, you can come up with what would be the optimal group sizes uh, to use. And to find these optimal group sizes is not always a simple thing to do. Um, and what I was presenting on uh, then uh, starting on uh, slide 22 and 23 was an actual comparison to uh, what Lowe's et al. had for their particular group testing algorithm. And what we have here is on the y axis the expected number of tests per individual. Again, we want this to be as low as possible. On the x-axis, we have the overall prevalence of disease. And graphed or plotted here in the black line is this is how Lowe's et al. would do for a particular 
uh, prevalence, what its expected number of tests would be. Let's compare that to if we were to implement Dorfman testing, always using the optimal group size. And what we can see here is that for most of the range of prevalences, Dorfman testing, which is only two stages, is better than what Lowe's at all did for, with their three-stage algorithm. Now, the dividing or the, the point where Lowe's at all does become better is approximately at 2% uh, prevalence. But even with that, then, um, if we were to look at three-stage uh, hierarchical testing, always using the optimal group sizes, denoted by this uh, blue dot dash line, we can see that that will always be better than what Lowe's at all did. So, in fact, there are more efficient ways to actually implement group testing uh, than the way that they approached it. Now, um, this column on this right-hand side of this table is uh, what's really of interest to laboratories right now. So, if we look at a case where pi tilde is 0 0.0193, which was uh, what Lowe's et al. actually observed for their particular paper, we can see what the expected increase in testing capacity would be by implementing a particular group testing algorithm. So with Lowe's et al., about 300%. But using Dorfman, a little bit of a simpler approach, it's almost 300% as well. But if you were to implement the best possible three-stage algorithm, you could increase your testing capacity by 400% on average. Okay, so now let's talk about non-hierarchical testing. And uh, uh, during our little stoppage there, I kind of described it. Uh, basically what this is, it's a way to do group testing where we test individuals in overlapping groups at the initial stage. So an individual could be represented in two, three, four groups. And the whole purpose is to try to reduce the number of individuals that need to go to a second stage of testing from a particular group testing algorithm. So by testing overlapping groups, you can kind of figure out who's positive and who's negative, and then you might have to go on to a second stage to further decode the positives and negatives. And so a widely used uh, particular type of non-hierarchical testing is array testing, and this is how it works. Uh, imagine, let's say, uh, you have your specimens arranged in a grid. So in an actual laboratory, what you might have is a rack of test tubes, and for, if you imagine, let's say, looking down uh, from above on this rack, the circles in this diagram basically represent the tops of the test tubes. Um, another way to think about this, too, is um, uh, perhaps you have a microplate uh, where the circles here represent wells in the microplate where there are actual specimens. And the way that array testing works, then, is that what we do is we form groups by row, we form groups by column throughout the entire array and do row tests and column tests. So in this particular case, uh, let's say two rows were positive, two columns were positive, and if you match up the positive rows and columns, that tells you where to actually do retesting. So those four uh, different specimens, everyone else can be declared negative. So in this case, we have a 10 by 10 array. Uh, only four uh, retests would be needed in a second stage of testing. So let's look at some notation associated with this then. Let's let uh, T be the number of tests for one array. D sub I J be the binary result for whether a retest is needed for a particular cell in the array. And what you can do is come up with an expression for the expected number of tests. Uh, it's equal to the number of row tests, I'm sorry, number of column tests, plus the number of row tests, sum over all the cells in the array, and what you sum is the probability of tests is actually needed. Now, when is a retest then needed? Um, I showed you on the previous slide uh, where row I and column J test positive. Uh, but also, you need to account for the fact that these infectious disease assays are not 100% accurate, and you could actually observe a case where row I test positive, but no columns test positive. Column J test positive, but no rows test positive. And so because of that, that makes coming up with an expression for this probability um, a lot more difficult. 
And it's actually a very long expression, so I'm not showing it here. Uh, but I will tell you, it's a function of the sensitivity and specificity of the assay, the probability that the individual is actually positive, and also the row and column group sizes. If you want to know more about our rate testing research, here's a, a number of uh, references on it. Again, a good reference is um, uh, Kim and All's paper. Another reference is uh, Katja Remlinger's paper that appeared in Technometrics in about, I think, about 2007 or 2008, which des describes how array testing can be used with respect to um, the development of uh, new pharmaceuticals. There are many other ways to implement array testing. For example, instead of a two-dimensional array, you can think of it as a three-dimensional array as well. So let's do some more comparisons. Um, again, to make things simple, we'll look at a sensitivity and specificity of one. We'll work with an overall prevalence. And on the y-axis this time, I decided to put the reduction in the expected number of tests. This is just one minus the expected number of tests per individual. This reduction is in comparison to testing everyone separately. Now, the higher the value, the better. On the x-axis, we have the overall disease prevalence. Dorfman testing is represented by the red line. And so we can see as that prevalence gets smaller, the reduction is greater. But we also see by implementing these other group testing algorithms, we can do better. Um, and in particular, if we look at tilde of 0 0.01, you focus again on this com on this right-hand side of this table. Um, what we see is that with Dorfman testing, we can increase our testing, expected test capacity by 400%. But if we were to implement three-stage hierarchical or rate testing, we can actually increase our testing capacity by more than 600%. This is why testing labs like to use group testing. So let's talk about some alternatives. Uh, this first alternative is one that we kind of discussed uh, when we're waiting to get the technical issues uh, solved. And that is, you know, suppose we could differentiate amongst individuals who are at higher risk for COVID-19, maybe due to their behavior, maybe due to symptoms, or maybe due to particular laboratory observations that are made on a specimen. Then what we can do is take advantage of that information and use it to come up with uh, what an individual's probability of being positive is. And then one, when one then combines that with group testing, one implements what's sometimes referred to as informative group testing, where we use information, this additional information about each individual, to guide the group testing process. And as you would imagine, then, if you're using more information, the testing process is going to be more efficient in the end. And indeed, that's what happens. Over the last 10 years, there's been a number of research papers in statistics on this particular subject. Uh, if you're looking for a place to start, I recommend Chris McMahon's uh, uh, set of papers that were in biometrics in 2012. I'm a co-author with it, as is Josh Tebbs from the University of South Carolina. But there's also papers in the medical literature, too, on it. And, you know, just based upon my experience with working people in laboratories, I will tell you that this is the way that they think about doing their testing. If they could differentiate amongst individuals who are at higher risk, they would implement testing differently. So how, how does then, how do you take into account this information? Real briefly, kind of a big picture idea of how one would do that is that with hierarchical testing, what you can do is you test low-risk individuals, meaning low values of this pi tilde sub i, test them in large groups. High-risk individuals, test them in small groups. In an extreme situation, let's say you have a, um, a pi tilde value of very close to 1 for someone, uh, you know, why would you want to test that person in group when you know that they have a high probability of disease? Just test them separately, thus test them in a small group. So hopefully that gives you some intuitive feel for why you would approach hierarchical testing in this manner. Now with array testing, what you can do is you arrange specimens in array to, again, to try to minimize the number of rows and columns that test positive. Uh, that will then reduce the number or the expected number of tests. 
and in actual implementation, reduce the number of tests. So now, how does actually one come up with uh, um, expressions for this pi tilde sub i, the probability an individual is truly positive? Well, estimate with a regression model. In many places where group testing is actually used, it's in a high volume clinical specimen testing setting, which is actually what we have now for COVID-19 in most labs. And um, in other applications where I've been involved with this, there's, because of this high volume, there is a large amount of data that's available that allows you to get a good estimate of that regression model. And uh, Chris McMahon will talk about some of those aspects if one actually tries to estimate that regression model using group testing data that has already arised. Now, with respect to Nebraska, we've actually tried to implement this. Um, we have information on anybody who's being tested. Do they have symptoms? Do they have particular risk factors? Unfortunately, as of this time right now, we have not actually implemented it, though. And that is actually not a non-statistical issue, but rather how the information was actually being collected that caused us problems. Um, this was back in May and June we tried to do this. Uh, but now some of these logistical issues um, have been solved, and we're looking into actually implementing this in clinical practice now. Now, another alternative to think about with respect to uh, COVID-19 and overall group testing as a whole is um, um, uh, applying group testing through what's called multiplex assays. I'm using that term to describe simultaneous tests for multiple diseases. This is going to become very important this fall once we're back into flu season where we will want to test people for both the flu and, and SARS-CoV-19 uh, the SARS uh, COVID uh, virus at the same time because they have similar symptoms. Fortunately, the CDC um, has um, actually, they just announced it uh, actually, I guess in June uh, before Congress, that they've actually developed a multiplex assay to test for both the flu and COVID-19 at the same time. But there are additional statistical issues that, involve, that are involved with implementing group testing in this situation. In particular, uh, the underlying stochastic framework uh, that's present here is a set of unobservable correlated binary random variables that represent the individual disease statuses of every individual. Where this comes up, why it's unobservable correlated binary comes into play because we're testing somebody for a test. So I'm sorry, we're testing somebody for a disease, so positive or negative. Correlated comes into play because we're testing an individual for multiple diseases at the same time. And unobservable comes into play because, again, these assays are not 100% accurate. And so we have to take into account the possibility of testing error. Then with looking at measures such as the expected number of tests uh, for a particular group testing algorithm, you need to account for this association between disease statuses for people. That will affect how many tests are needed. Now, over the last five years or so, uh, myself, uh, Chris McMahon, and my colleague uh, Josh Tebbs at the University of South Carolina and other collaborators, we've looked into this problem with respect to multiplex assets. Um, the first paper that was written on it wasn't actually written until 2013. And, uh, and so here are some references if you want to explore this further. Um, how one actually goes, goes about implementing group testing in this particular situation. Um, and one reason why I want to bring this up is that the key here is that we have the tools to do this. We need to actually use the tools so that uh, we can get back to some uh, normal sense of, of living here in the United States and actually the world. Um, group testing allows you to implement large, uh, wide-scale screening. Okay, so I'm going to then conclude with uh, taking a look at one more tweet here. Um, now, coincidentally, and this was on March 17th, uh, I tweeted the following. Coincidentally, I am recovering right now from symptoms like those for COVID-19. I don't know if it is COVID-19, 
because I cannot get tested. Fortunately, I'm doing a lot better uh, now than I was a few days ago. Perhaps my research area could have made testing more available. So it's kind of ironic that over the last 15 years, I've been doing research in this area of group testing, and if group testing would have been implemented then, that might have helped me determine if I was actually positive for COVID-19. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Sorry about the technical problems that we had. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. <clears throat> um, what I'll do right now is I will ask uh, Chris McMahon to join in and get his slide started. Uh, while, while we're doing that, while Chris is getting his slide started, um, I think we can take one question, and and, uh, uh, and I have one here from Emily Nystrom. And Emily asks, have you encountered any challenges in transitioning your research into production and use for COVID-19? And what type of results do practitioners, possibly non-statisticians, usually expect when discussing actually using innovative group testing procedures? So I guess generally, what are the challenges that you run into in trying to get people to, to listen to you? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 there are challenges, definitely. Um, what I typically do is um, hopefully get them um, interested in using Dorfman testing to begin with. Um, that can often be a big barrier because laboratories are often uh, very concerned about the dilution problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but the key is, you know, there's been a lots of research now done regarding COVID-19 but also in many other applications or in terms of uh, many other diseases as well. And as long as we can show that indeed uh, there's not a dilution problem or the dilution problem really isn't of concern um, and we have ways to get around it, uh, then they're more receptive to actually using group testing. Um, a huge barrier though is uh, testing diagnostic companies or these companies that develop these tests. I often attend, um, you know, like conferences where uh, these non-stack conferences where uh, these uh, diagnostic testing companies will have displays, and I go and talk to the representatives, you know, talk about group testing, and I hate to say this, but they're typically negative towards it. Uh, they don't believe that one can do the testing without having a diagnostic, uh, without having a dilution problem. Uh, but if you think of it from their perspective, they're going to lose money if people are using their uh, testing products less. Um, I think that's, uh, that is an issue. Now, with respect to uh, doing these more complex group testing algorithms, um, yeah, that, that is an issue as well. Um, you know, there are complexities with that. And as you can see, with respect to implementing informative group testing in Nebraska, we've run into non-statistical issues to actually implement it. But I will tell you, they do really want to implement it, and it could actually make a difference. That's, that's good to hear. Well, thanks again very much, Chris.